Hi everyone, my name is Ryan Robitaille, and I'm here to talk about a Clojure REPL visualization tool I built called Data Rabbit. So, what is it? Well, think of it as a canvas of REPL blocks, each with its own inputs and outputs um, that allows passing data in a flow-based ETL kind of style, and then having all of this laid out in a way to visualize as much as possible. And when I say visualize, I don't necessarily mean scatter plots and bar charts, although there's tons of that. I mean how your application uh, talks to the rest of the application and what that means at the edges, right? So whether you're doing like some type of, you know, uh, you know, artistic project or maybe an ad hoc analysis of some data, such as this, or maybe you have a whole presentation set out with layouts that you want to present to somebody else and the flow map here is essentially a documentation of how you got to your answer but let's start at the beginning so here we have a basic canvas um, there's some starter blocks here um, but if you see there are some uh, interface panels um, anyone who plays uh, first person shooters you probably know you spend a lot of time you know, on the PC at least with your, your left hand and WASD and I use that for a lot of shortcut keyboard commands here so you see me like flipping around panels that's what it is so WASD hides and shows lots of these panels so um, uh, so if you see me doing that you, you know if you hear the clicking um, I, lo I love I love uh, two hand interfaces with you know keyboard and mouse actions working together anyways um, up here you can see where the different flows are for this particular flow set um, this is a browser over here on the left to see in my, you know, rabbit repo, so to speak, what different flows I have and what dashboards presentations are available for them. Um, this is a canvas panel for dragging things into the flow. This bottom panel, saving, loading, um, quick reminder of the keyboard commands down here on the left. And this right panel is the editor. And the editor is kind of like the, the, the heart of this interface. Um, so... The way, the way Rabbit works is that each of these blocks is a REPL, right? Either either a closure script REPL that gets evaluated bootstrapped within the browser here, or one that is connected to either the internal end REPL server running as part of the jar, or your own end REPL with your own libraries and, and you know, whatever else. Um, there's a code window, there's an output window. Uh, there's a bunch of different configurations you can use. Um, and the things that you can add to this window are context-based on based on what you're doing, what kind of block it is, and what kind of code you have in there. Um, so in this case, we have, we have the code is just saying what kind of Java version and closure version. Then we have the output. It's this out auto, you see, will nicely format the string. But if I just wanted the raw text, I could say, give me the text, and that's you know what you'd expect out of REPL is the raw, the raw output. Things are a little more interesting when we talk about how blocks talk to other blocks, right? So here we have a block, as you can see, it's, it's this green color. Yeah, colors matter a lot. Um, Anytime you see a colored box, box or an outline or a flow line, it's because of what kind of generalized data type data type is you know going in or out of that box. So it makes it a lot easier to see things from a, a you know a far off perspective. You know what is happening as I can see integer pass an integer pass an integer. Um, but anyways, you'll you'll see more of that as we go through. So I have this box as an integer. My code is two, right? It outputs two. That makes sense. You can see here. Uh, let me back up. It's passing that to this other box, which is taking it as an input parameter. In this case, it's in and adding nine to it. As we can see from the hover, there's the two I started with. Here's the 11 that I created. And then if you can see this other highlighting, we're sending it to another box, sending that 11 on to this box, which again adds one to it once again. Um, very, very simple, but just to give you an idea of like how the box, box you know, pass values to each other. So, what else can we do in this box? I mentioned data types a second ago. We can see here's a map. See it renders by the by the auto uh, as a fancy kind of nested data structure here. We could see it as its regular text. That's fine. Go to auto. Um, I can also kind of like Lightroom. I can evaluate parts of the code without evaluating the whole code and outputting it to the flow. Right. For example, this has range eleven. Um, I can highlight just that form and say range 11. Oh, cool, it's a list, zero to 10, awesome. I could highlight, you know, me wrapping vector in range 11. I can see, oh, it's, it's, it's a vector, unsurprisingly, zero to 10, cool. Um, I can also do some direct manipulation scrubbing of values. Uh, in this case, you know, I can make that range higher or lower. Um, you'll, we'll get into this a bit more. 
Um, you know, no, nothing super groundbreaking there. You know, Brett Victor style, um, Jack Rusher, Maria Cloud. There's been, there's been a lot of really cool stuff with direct manipulation. Um, the concert of code and UI together and like getting to that end result you want without having to kind of, you know, peck and peck and render and peck and render. Um, so, you know, this is, this is a map. Um, what is cool about this kind of interface is that if we're rendering out, let's move this map over here. I can do things like, hey, like let's say this map, let's say I got this map back from a, you know, a web API, but I really only want this H2 value, right? So you'd normally take it and you write a get in. Well, but here, since we have this whole flow based passing structure, I can just say, well, give me this key over here. And then, you know, that key is one, two, three, five, seven. And it's basically doing a get in this incoming parameters and give me in more stuff h2 and for anything else here i could say this you know i can ask for h1 i can get this whole key here with my my vector range and then let's put this out here again if i'm modifying my code of the source obviously you can see in the on the, on the bottom there it flows out to the blocks that consume it um, and that, and that's kind of how this whole, you know, flow based thing, uh, works. But anyways, back to, back to blocks. So getting a little more complicated. So here's, here's a hiccup, uh, block unsurprising, you know, hello there. I can use the scrub ability and change things just like I can with regular integers. Um, I have certain key pairs that allow you to, you know, specify the values that are allowed and that's all done in the user space. Um, Again, you know, padding, what feels right, what looks right, you know, again, direct, direct manipulation, not the focus of the demo, but something that I think is very, very cool and very, very helpful in these kind of interfaces. Um, what's neat about this is you see out here, it says out render, you know, it has this blue color for render object. It realizes that it's hiccup and it can be shown as a closure script, you know, renderable, like JavaScript rendered object, but it's still just a vector. You know, I could say out text and there's my vector. I could say um, out map, which is that map visual visualizer from earlier and see, it's just this map object, right? But when in render mode, th there it is, right? So it's kind of like part of the seeing, right? You know, I, I want to see what I'm working on in as many ways as possible, um, even if they might not make a whole lot of sense. You know, I, I don't necessarily want to see my hiccup as this nested map object, but uh, maybe you do, you know, maybe I want to see that here. Maybe I want to see the code code there. I want to see the rendering here. And I want to see, you know, the output of what it looks like, you know, as that object there, as I, as I, you know, as I mess with it and get it to like that final state. So let's get a little more complicated. So this is a recom box with some flex boxes and an atom. I click on these, the atom should change, but we really can't see it. So let me see here. I can drag out this panel that says atoms, which basically looks at all the atoms in this flow. And then let's put the rendering over here. And then I can see the atom change as I click on things, which is kind of nice. I also have this little star here. So it realizes there's an atom in this block itself. So it adds it as an editor panel. So let's see, let's just pick this. I'll put my code here. I'll put my rendering here and I'll put my atom down here. So now I have a dedicated panel in my editor for this atom that I'm working on with my code and able to see, you know, what is going on. And you can imagine this would be a much more complicated example if I'm, you know, consuming maps and, and creating maps or something like that. But just to give you an idea of like, you know, this is kind of what I mean when I say, you know, visualize things. Um, what else is kind of good about this interface is that, so now we have this button atom as kind of an object in our UI, right? You see down here, it says display as auto on canvas, um, which auto is the render. You know, I could also say display it as text on the canvas, right? Or render on the canvas just so you, we can specify, you know, what is an editor thing and what is a canvas thing. But I can also say, hey, this button atom says flow output downstream. What if I want the button atom to flow out? So if I normally, if you take a box, if you take a block and you drag it out, it will send itself, right? This evaluates to a string called string. If I drag it out, it's itself. It, it just sends the actual materialized value. But because I changed here, because I drag button atom to this outflow, when I drag out from this object, it gives me, it gives me the atom. Which you may think, hey, that's silly. Like, why don't I just have my other code deref the atom itself instead of passing it through this other system? It's like, well, yeah, that makes sense. But what if I have a closure script block that's talking to uh, a closure end repl block or an end repl block that's talking to another end repl block that they aren't directly connected to and they can't efficiently pass that atom, but it has to flow, you know, we can flow it through the system and make that, make that work anyways. So 
Also, it's kind of worth noting that um, while I am passing this value via the flow line, I could always, let's see, button atom. I could always have another block that derefs it on its own. And then we'd see a flow line rendered anyways because it's implied, right, that I'm flowing this value to that except by derefing the atom instead of literally passing it to this code. Uh, you can see, you know, uh, deref button atom. But on to something new. Let's start with a new fresh flow here. Um, I have these down here called user kits. They're essentially blocks that have their code already written um, that I like to use as good starting points for things. Uh, you know, for example, um, you know, basic color picker, color picker components. Um, that's all set up with the atom. So as you see, it's just changes an atom. If I drag this here, you know, it changes an atom with the hex value of the color. And then you can then use that atom for whatever you want in your code. You know, it makes for, for easy things. Easy to create stuff from scratch. I have this other one uh, called Sample SQLite JDBC. So this is a JDBC map, you know, connection map. Um, and, you know, kind of like you would have a reader, right? Um, the editor realizes it's a JDBC map, so it tries to connect to it and get the metadata, and then has this out JDBC panel, which I'm using down here and using for um, the Canvas version. That's another cool thing about these, these kits is that you can define the code, the editor configuration, and how it's going to be displayed. So if a new person picks up your object, they're like, oh, like this person has already set it up for the way it, it needs to be, right? So this is a, a, a SQL database, a SQLite database on the machine here, and has its own, you know, special... Uh, uh, interaction. So the Bigfoot sightings table, I can drag this out here. UFO sightings, I drag this out here. But it's basically saying, hey, like, um, he's dragging a table out of this JDBC connection. Why not we just create a select all? So I, ha I have this whole concept of generating code to get someone to the next stage, not creating a magic function to hide things. But if you want to do something, the system should generate naive code that allows you to get there that you can then go back and fix and tweak and pull apart and try to understand um, you know, very, very basic primitive type code, right? Because um, this could easily be like rabbit JDBC function one, and then you pass it a thing, and then it shows out your output. And that's cool, but it, it doesn't really help me learn anything in the spirit of kind of like a REPL, right? So we've created these, these SQL queries. Nice. Um, also, since it knows there's a JDBC connection coming in, you can see the highlight here, the editor says, okay, well, we aren't a JDBC ourselves anymore, like this box is, but we do have one coming in, so what can I do with that? Well, another editor panel is available here as a simple select builder, right? So I can get rid of this and I can say, hey, give me the class of the sighting and count. Right? Class is like some Bigfoot sighting thing. I guess A and B are normal and C is like, he comes to your house and lets your dog out. I, I, I don't know, don't, don't shoot the messenger. But anyway, so cool. So now I have this, this group by of class and count. Let's go down here and let's make this guy, you know, a little more tasteful to fit what we're trying to do. Cool. Now I have this grid. Um, the code is very naive that generated. You can go in here and change it, do whatever. It's just like I said, the, the editor is trying to get you to that next step. It's not trying to create pristine, amazing code. It's just, hey, let's keep moving on with our analysis, right? So what can we do with this? Well, let's drag it out, which will copy itself. Sorry there. Misclicked. All right. So let's drag it out. So now I have a materialized version of the data set, right? So this is a, a reference to JWC. This one is literally just the row set, which in, in this case, a row set is just a, a vector of like, you know, uh, conformed, you know, maps here. Um, and you see this, you see this extra editor panel. Again, it, it understands what's in there. It's like, oh, there's a row set. We can do stuff with a row set. You know, building on that idea of like what's coming in, what's coming out, or what's coming in and what we evaluate, we can have different UI that helps the user forward, you know, just another step, right? So in this case, it's this clicked row panel. Um, what's neat about that is that by clicking on a row, it gets an idea of what kind of map we're working with here. And it makes the assumption that this is a row set. These are all uniform maps. So we can, we can do some things with it. So... We have single operations here, right? Like count. Um, I can make a vector of distinct. Let's just get rid of this guy. Let's get rid of this too. Again, since we've materialized the vector. We can now count it. We can get the distinct values. Um, you know, nothing, nothing groundbreaking, but, but stuff that you might want to do, right? Um, count one, maybe I want to sum that up. And this is stuff that's all happening post-process after the SQL, right? Or I can say, hey, 
let's re-aggregate this. There's only one dimension, so I'm not going to go into that. But if you wanted to re-aggregate, you know, do another group by on top of it in Clojure, it can generate that for you. Or uh, I'm using this data viz library um, called Nevo, this JavaScript library. I can say, hey, why don't class be X and count be Y and there's a sum. And then let me drag that bar out. Cool. So just like the count and just like the sum, I've said, hey, like I have this thing that I want. Generate some code so I can get there, right? So now, now I've generated a bar chart from the SQL query from the only code the user has actually typed in in this example is probably the JDBC map for getting the connection here. So, okay, cool. We have this bar chart. It applies all the same things we can do anything else, right? I can say layout vertical. I'm like, all right, we can do horizontal because I have that key saved as a thing you might want to do. Uh, maybe it's a little cramped there on the left, you know, maybe we're going to give a little more space there. Um, you know, colors, as I, as I said, lots of, lots of stuff you can change here. But it's something interesting. If I click on one of these values, you can see in out here, it's created this map. Because clicking on, in, in my world, you know, clicking on visualizations is something that people do a lot. And there's a lot of, you know, cool actions you can do with that. So let's see here. So now that we have a map, I can drag out and it says flow output atom 22211. Okay, so we already have the map there. I can drag it out, and I have this map. Cool. Just like before, since it's a map object, I can say, hey, what is this? Okay, so these look like they're internal, like, Nevo things for the values. Ah, this data key, this looks like the data of that bar. So let's see, I want the class. Let's pull the class out. Cool. So now when I click on the bar, uh, if I click on it twice, it goes to nil. That's why I did that. So like B, A, if I can see if I can get C here, C. Um, so now, okay. We've got a SQL query, we've got a bar chart, and we're kind of flowing that value through to something else. Cool. So let me go into this, which is essentially just the string class A. I'm going to turn this into a map. I'm going to turn it back into a map that has the field title as its key. Because with that, I can say, okay, let's bring out another big field, Bigfoot query. So it's the same select all as before. Now that this is a map with the value and the key, I could drag this into the SQL query and the SQL query should recognize that. Again, generating some very, very naive code to put that into the where clause. Again, you should rewrite this as something else, but in the spirit of moving forward, you know, this is, this is, uh, this is what we're trying to do here, right? Uh, it says, okay, if I see that class, you know, change your where clause, right? So now we have, if I click on B or C, I get different data. So... Taking that one more step further, let's go here and let's say I want to look at uh, the season. Um, we'll just do we'll do season and state and count. And if it's nil, it's rendering. There's a little bit of rendering bug here when I'm not 100% in. Uh, the virtual table doesn't render the whole thing. That's that's something that's on my to-do list, but. Cool, so now we have a filtered table from visualization. And let's use clicked row again. And let's make that a visualization. So let's do a heat map. So season is X, state is color, and count as Y. And we'll pull this guy out. Uh, all right, that's kind of interesting. We change our class, it'll change the filter. Cool. And just like the other visualization, if I click on a, on a point, it will give me another map to use and some further interactions. But let's just say, okay, we have some stuff that's at the beginning of kind of an interesting exploration here. Um, so how do we, you know, show this? Well, that's the other thing that's great about like this canvas-based kind of interfaces is let's bring in a view composer. And it's pretty much just what you would think. It's how do we show this stuff together. And what's cool about this is that, you know, these REPL blocks, with the exception of the flows, don't really know anything, you know, about each other necessarily. Um, so composing them together is just basically, you know, this is the logic of how it runs. And then the presentation layer is just how do we want a region to be, to be shown and has no bearing on the, you know, the, the execution logic, right? So let's see here. Let's bring in, let's bring in this data set. Let's bring in our heat map. Let's bring in that first bar chart and yeah let's do that well we'll bring in the total too so let's make this a little smaller here and then i hit 
uh, F for preview. And we can see, you know, they, it kind of showed up. It By default, it comes in as a horizontal, um, you know, as an H box, a flex box. I could also see it vertically, you know, but uh, me being like a Tableau guy, like my, my favorite thing is, is floating layouts, right? So I click floating, I can say, hey, this Bigfoot sighting over here, we're gonna put this over there. Uh, bar, this is our filter, so we wanna put this up in the top somewhere. And then, you know, the count, um, we could probably format that better, but for now, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll put it right here. And where is our, here is our actual data. So I'm just kind of throwing these together real quick, but you can kind of, uh, get the idea, let's actually put you over here and then I'll put the heat map up here where I could potentially fit that axis. And we'll get rid of the edges. And then, you know, now this works just as it does in the canvas, except in a more of a dashboard style you might be used to, right? I click on things, it follows the logic, things happen. And what's great about building things this way, you know, that you want to share with your colleagues, uh, is that they can go into the flow and look at where you got your data, how you came up with this. I um, mean, at the cost of a little bit of render speed, um, that's actually a, a, pretty, a pretty awesome thing. So, again, quick, quick demo of REPL logic and flow and then having a layer of presenting that separate from the logic, but, you know, still very much uh, back and forth with it. So I've talked about a lot of closure script stuff, but what about, you know, closure uh, and REPL connectivity themselves? So here's an example that connects to two end REPLs that are not built into the jar. Um, this one with some uh, side closure stuff with some data ML from, their, from the GitHub, uh, doing some machine learning on some Titanic data. And this other one is using the Encanter lib to generate some uh, PNG visualizations. Um, what I love about this is that you can see with a closure REPL block, we can do multiple outputs. And not only can we do multiple outputs, but they, when they come into the UI, they get filtered through the same way as a, as a CLGS one is. So you see we have a, a REPL output block, which would show us just what we would see on the, on the command line. Um, right through the models, there's like peaking at the data, you know, with a nicely formatted way you would see it in a REPL. Um, but we can also do like, for example, you know, map sequence reader, Titanic test, and then it shows up as a row set, which is, you know, a vector of maps, and then the UI knows what to do with that. So I can grab this row set, this training row set, um, and drag that into a panel, and it says, hey, this is just a grid, I can draw it as a grid, right? And then since we have it in the UI, we can do all those cool things that we did with other things. So let's go down here, here's a Fairly similar example from the GitHub page, also pulling in a CSV set uh, of, of stocks. Um, in this case, you know, we're pulling in the whole result set. I'm sending it off to a closure script block, which renders it as a grid, and then visualizing it the same way we did with those, you know, Bigfoot things. And now I can kind of work in concert with it and build more UI. Maybe I have a click here that feeds back to the original query, shows some more visualizations, etc. It's like, how can we have, you know, closure script and closure working together seamlessly without having to really care about each other, you know? Uh, here's another one. Here's here's Encanter, right? This is just doing some very basic Encanter like sample vi visits, and this is me sending two slider values, which is a closure script atom to the closure REPL uh, as a new value in the flow, as we can see here on the left, floats coming in, and then it renders out um, it renders out uh, the PNGs. Um, what's also kind of neat about rendering out like scientific like you know PNG stuff on on uh, a closure REPL is that not only can I add this stuff to my editor panel, right? But I can kind of say, hey, let's just put this over here and let's put this guy over here. Oh, that's the same one. Let's put him over here. You know, I can kind of stretch out from this initial, um, from my initial analysis and then start using the canvas for stuff that doesn't even really have its own block, right? It's still part of this block. Anyways, real, real quick example of some closure stuff. So, you know, thanks for your time. Uh, hit me up uh, on Twitter, you know, uh, email me, etc. cetera. Um, feel free to, you know, you know, use it and reach out. Um, but the most important thing here, I think, is, is less about using this tool. But, you know, realize that, you know, we can, especially to, to the builders out there, right? You know, we can build things in all kinds of different ways. And we don't have to stick to the linear up and down vertical box kind of craze that's kind of, you know, 
spawned a lot of the like notebook tools and things and like that stuff is great i'm not saying their way is wrong i'm not saying my way is right but i'm saying we can take these ideas from years ago you know flow-based programming and direct manipulation and you know even lisp is from you know like the 50s and 60s um and work it into our current you know our, our current systems and see how that works out i mean there's so much dogma these days about what is the right way to do an interface and what is the right way to program and like all that it, i think it prevents a lot of people from trying these different things that may be old forgotten ideas that um could be used for interesting effect you know these days um uh, brett vector has a great talk from a number of years ago called uh, the future of programming and in it one of the things he posits is that um one of the reasons they built so much great stuff in like the 50s and 60s and 70s is that you know they had no idea of what programming was they just did what they thought was interesting and we've kind of like lost that um so yeah you know don't be afraid to break some rules and uh you may you may find out stuff works may some stuff doesn't work but something interesting might shake out of it and it might be something new and it might be something old um but don't be afraid to try new things and uh cheers <laughs>